Hey everybody, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Eric Enga, the General Manager of Proficient Digital. Uh, and I'm excited to have Ann Hanley with me here today. Uh, say hi, Ann. There we go. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> Good. 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 So, hey, if you don't know Ann, she's Wall Street Journal bestselling author. Uh, IBM uh, named her one of seven people shaping modern, modern marketing. Uh, oh my gosh, that's an impressive thing to uh, be able to say. Um, <laughs> the author of Everybody Writes, uh, I'm only going to do part of the uh, title, that, but your guide to ridiculously good content. Uh, Chief Content Officer of uh, Marketing Prof, prolific on social media. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to you today, and thanks for Yeah, thank us. you so much for having me. This is, um, this is a treat. Talk to you in the middle of the week. Y yes, indeed. <laughs> So, um, and what we want to talk about today is really personalization and content marketing together. And, and I think maybe we should start the conversation with uh, an opening question. It's like, what do we really mean by personalization? Are we talking about dynamic content optimization or uh, using data for automated content or user generated content or tone of voice? I mean, what do we mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that the short answer, Eric, is uh, yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's it's all of that. Um, I think in you know in marketing over the past few years, obviously, um, we've had the opportunity to use data and technology to be able to deliver increasingly personalized experiences to the customers and the and the prospects that we're trying to attract. Um, but as you just said, I think it's so much more than that, too. I think it's how we're communicating. So the tone of voice that we're using um, through our emails, through our social channels, all across the, the digital space. Um, but I think it's also, um, you know, things like, are you bringing the, your customers, customer voices into your own marketing? Um, and then from a from a from a company standpoint, too, are you personalizing who you are as a brand? You know, are you going behind the scenes a little bit? Are you showing your customers and your prospects who you are as much as you're letting them know that you know who they are? Um, so that's what I that's how I think about it. I think of it maybe a little bit more uh, broadly beyond just you know the sort of textbook definition of um, of personalization. I, I don't think it's just about data and technology. I also think it's about being human um, and really putting the person in personalization from both a brand as well as an audience standpoint. Yeah, and I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of people miss is, is ha to put it in my own words, just having your own personality associated with your brand or the people mm -hmm. representing the brand and really projecting that really well. and. Uh, and giving something that people can attach to yeah. is, is as important as figuring out how to, to interact with them. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the that's the person in personalization. You want to use your personality. You also want to make sure that you're using personalization to create an emotional connection. Um, you know, you've probably heard this, but one of the big one of the big problems I think with personalization is that it does veer into the creepy lane sometimes, you know, <laughs> we've all had those experiences where we're shopping for something online or we're looking at something on Instagram and the next thing you know, that thing is following you all over and you're getting an email that says, hey, did you mean to put this in your cart? Um, you know, that's where I feel like uh, as brands, we tend to go immediately. You know, we tend to think about the technology first right. and let's let's chase these people. Let's let them know. Let's let's harass them through personalization in a lot of ways. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't think it's I, I think it's the opportunity is so much greater than that, like you just said, is to really think about your personality as a brand and connecting in a very human, emotional way to the people that you are trying to attract. Yeah, and one really kind of maybe side topic, but I want to bring it up anyway, is that um, this really parlays itself into nearly, well, pretty much every environment you're communicating in. And yeah. I did a, a presentation not too long ago with uh, Dwayne Forrester about uh, the evolution of voice interactions and, and you know, having, uh, it, well, it starts with voice search, but more broadly, just voice interactions between brands and uh, and their customers. and you got to project your persona, even at the voice level, even if that's the only element that you have uh, in the entire picture in the communication. It, it's everywhere that mm. this has to show itself. 
Yeah, yeah, and I guess you know that's sort of what we mean by omni-channel, right? And that's a, right. I, I kind of hate that word as much as I love it, um, because it's such, it feels so buzzwordy. But yeah. really, what it means is, are you presenting the same way on social media as you are in your blog, on your website, in voice communications, you know, all across everything? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you bring up voice because I think that's there's a lot of unexplored territory there, and we're really just at the beginning of figuring out how do we leverage that channel as part of this omni-channel experience how do we bring all those touch points together um and so i think that's you know that's sort of the, the next challenge for brands is not just in voice but how do you actually align all the pieces so that it's it, it is sort of a, a coherent cohesive customer experience so to speak yeah no absolutely so what about this though is personalization really the enemy of scaling because everybody wants to scale that's what everybody thinks about you know what i mean mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I don't think it's necessarily the the enemy of scaling. Um, I mean, I think if you think about just the technology that we have available to us, you know, that allows you to scale personalization at a at a. Um, I mean, that allows you to to use personalization at scale. Um, but I also think that using things like our brand voice is that's that's something that we can all do at scale. Um, I don't know. What's your take on that, Eric? Well, I mean, for me, one of the things that I like to think about is when people say scaling, my fear is that they're at the point where they want to be all things to all people. Mm. And they're trying to address uh, every single audience. And here's a slide just to capture this concept, right? Is to me, effective scaling does start with really, uh, and personalization both, starts with really identifying your target audience and learning how to deliver your persona or your um, personality to that target audience, which necessarily means excluding others. And that's actually a good thing. And if you're really trying to grow your business and you try to address everybody, you'll, you'll fail. That's the path to mediocrity. Yeah, a hundred percent. I I totally agree with that. Um, I think there is a default in marketing that you know we want to get as many people into in the B two B world, the top of the funnel, so to speak. We want to appeal to as many people as possible, and then you know nurture the heck out of those people <laughs> throughout uh, throughout our content campaigns, throughout our our everything that we're doing right over time. Um, but I actually think that's the wrong approach. I actually think it's much more efficient long term and it's smarter to figure out who is it that we actually are are talking to and that's actually one way i think or, or one way to do that one way to figure out uh, how do we weed out those people that aren't going to be a good fit for us is through things like the content that we're publishing and the tone of voice that we're using because you're automatically going to attract the people to you if you know who you're talking to um, right. you're going to attract those people to you as much as you will repel the people who are not a great fit for your brand um, so i think to the degree to which we can figure out you know who we are as brands and and think through our personality and our persona and who we are as a, as a company and who we are as people and why we are doing what we're doing. So that number one, and then who is the best fit for our products and services and who are they and really having a conversation with those people and approaching your marketing more in, in that way, um, you know, versus just brand to target. I think it's much more efficient and effective to think about marketing in a, in a human way to the people we're trying to connect with. So again, it's the, putting the person and, and personalization and not thinking about target audiences as much as actual people, because that's what we are, right? Which sounds so yeah. elementary, but I don't, I don't see enough of it really, especially in the B2B space. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this whole thing about, you know, connecting, you know, and having a connection that, that, that really is sort of, at its heart, there's this one-on-one -on -one aspect to it. Now, brands can accomplish it with the right kind of uh, personalization, sometimes operating at scale, depending on how you how you do that, mm -hmm. uh, just by understanding who they're trying to connect with and what those people are like and what they might respond to, and then focusing on those things. And as we've both said now, it necessarily means you're shutting some other people out. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good thing. Yeah, I think so. Um... I was just thinking as you were talking, you know, I've been, uh, so I, I've been, the spring has been kind of a crazy spring for me. And I've been uh, at, a, at a, just a string of marketing conferences and marketing events. Um, and a, a big theme of a lot of the events that I've been to recently has been about this customer experience 
that marketers and, and right. marketing leaders are really feeling this pressure to um, to really execute on the customer experience, to really put the customer at the heart of everything that that they do and that the organization does, um, which again, sounds super elementary. Like, aren't are we already doing that? But I don't think we are. Like, I think we're still communicating uh, more about, or we're, we're communicating as brands versus trying to think about what does the customer actually need from us. Um, and so I think that, that another mandate, you know, as part of the customer experience is really thinking through your personalization strategy and how do you actually, you know, connect with, with people as individuals. No, absolutely. So what are some things that marketers should change to make content marketing a more personalized conversation? Yeah. Um, do we have do we have a slide from our research, Andy? Maybe we could pull that up. Okay. There you go. There it is. Um, yeah. So what you're looking at here essentially is a is um, a bit of research from the content marketing study of, of 2019 that Marketing Profs did does well. We've done it every year with the Content Marketing Institute. I think this is the the ninth it's year awesome, that we've done it. Awesome study, by the way. Yeah. Like that. Anybody out yeah. there hasn't. Uh, uh, looked at this study, you need to go get this data. It's amazing insights about uh, uh, B2B uh, focus. Well, you do B2C versions too, content marketing. Yes. It's just yes. fantastic stuff. But I'm sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, no, no, thanks for that plug. No, and if you, if anybody here wants to pick it up, we can probably just either uh, put a link in the chat to it or you can go to the Marketing Pro Slideshow channel and you can grab a copy there. It's ungated, it's free, you can pick it up. Um, but you know, the beauty of the study is that it does give brands a sense of what's going on in, in content marketing. It's sort of the state of the industry and in, in content marketing from a B2B and B2C perspective. Um, and it's interesting because you know, over time, like I said, this is the ninth year I think that we've done it. Um, over time, it does really give you a sense of sort of where we're at in the industry. So I'm gonna just pull the numbers up just one more time again so I can just talk through them. Sorry, I went a little too long in the preamble maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have the slide or no? Let's get that slide back up, please. I think they're probably working on it. Uh, there we go. 42%. There we go. All right. Sorry. All, right. All right. So we were talking about opportunities. So basically yeah. what, what this says to me or how do you start to think about personalization from a, from through your content marketing, from a content marketing point of view? Um, you know, what the that top stat there, 42% of the marketers who are um, who are actually talking to their customers to understand their needs that's only 42 percent i mean that to me spells enormous opportunity that you know so many more of us i think could actually be talking to our customers to figure out you know how is it that we can serve you better what information is useful to you how do you make decisions where do you get your information from all those things like trying to get a sense of, of who is it that we're actually talking to, who is it that we're marketing to. Um, and then that second step there uh, is really talking about how only 23% of us are using any sort of audience participation. So things like, um, you know, user generated content, really getting your customers into your marketing as part of the conversation. Um, so I think, again, enormous opportunity there as well. So just um, wanted to share those because I think when you ask, you know, where do we start? I think those are two really great places. Start talking to your customers, really gathering insight on a regular basis. Um, and it doesn't have to be super complicated. It can be a survey. It can be a phone call. It can be coffee with a customer. It can be any of those things. I still don't think that marketers are talking to customers enough. Um, and then secondly, try to bring new voices to the table, bring the voices of your customers directly into your marketing. I think super effective way to think about personalization. Oh, absolutely. And one of the really neat things that's happening more broadly from an SEO perspective and what Google is doing these days is Google is investing so much of their energy in terms of who they're sending people to from their search results around the goal of um, really what ends up being the best customer experience for the people that they send to a given website. So if you invest in the right kind of content marketing strategies, not only are you doing really great stuff from a traditional content marketing point of view, but you're probably also driving the crap out of your SEO. <laughs> uh, and it's an amazing amount of opportunity that Anne has just really given us a, a sense of, yes, it, it can be a big investment. We'll talk about more of that about that more in a second, but, but the fact of the matter is your competition probably isn't doing it. And that's how I spell opportunity. Yeah. 
So right, and I and actually, I don't think it needs to be a bigger investment necessarily. I mean, I think like we talked about thinking about how is it that you're communicating, you know, really understanding and, and nailing those elements first. Um, that's not a massive investment. I mean, certainly the more you dig into the data and the tech side of it, so being able to do things like dynamic content and being able to customize, um, you know, customer journeys and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's it. That's in can get expensive. Um, but I don't think that it, it has to be. And I also feel like that it's, it's, um, there are ways to do it. There are, there are ways to personalize your brand and, and personalize who you are as a company that really don't cost you anything at all, aside from, you know, maybe a, a lot of brain power. Right. Well, projecting your own persona, right, should yeah. be fairly straightforward, for example. Yeah. So, and I agree, you don't necessarily have to invest a ton of money uh, uh, to make this work. And, and also, you know, if you're a small local business, the way I try to think about it is, am I doing a better job at it than the people I'm competing with? And if I'm a small local business and I'm not competing with some Fortune 200 company, I just have to be able to do something that's at the scale that works for my size of business and make sure that I'm standing out well compared to, mm -hmm. you know, the people I'm competing with. Mm -hmm. So, right. Um, so what's the coolest example of personalized marketing you've seen uh, of late? Um, so I have a couple of favorites and hopefully we can show a slide that I pulled ahead of time to, um, to share with you today. So, you know, I'm a writer, right? I'm a, a real content, content nerd. And, um, and so one of the brands that I use on a regular basis, I have, um, I have a, a browser extension is called Grammarly. And essentially what Grammarly does is it helps me improve my writing and my communication. There we go. Um, by making what I, whatever I'm, I'm creating, they're, they're sort of like a, it's kind of like a spell check on steroids. So it's like a spell checker with, a, with an editor kind of wrapped into one. It's not an, um, I don't think it's a substitution for an actual real live editor because I use one of those too, but Grammarly is kind of, I think of it as like my first pass. And so what you're looking at here is a copy of an email every single week. They send me an email with my statistics, right? So they tell me sort of where I compare as compared to the rest of the Grammarly audience. Um, and, you know, again, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a nerd, right? So I love getting this <laughs> email because there's something that makes me kind of proud about, you know, seeing whether I'm more productive than the rest of the audience or, you know, how many different words that I use, you know, they give me all these sort of touch points um, or, or all these different benchmarks. I mean, just to tell me like where I am and um, it just sort of, it kind of gamifies it for me, but it's in a, it, they, the way they deliver it is incredibly personalized. Now, obviously Grammarly has all of this data on me because it's their own data that, that they're collecting. Um, but the way they deliver it is just very fun. The other thing that they do is that they use my usage of their program um, to to reward me. So they'll they'll deliver badges to me, like when I either do you know do a particular uh, like when I when I've been using Grammarly for so many weeks, I get a badge. Um, when I've used like complicated words more than there we go <laughs> more than others. Um, more than other users of the Grammarly product, you know, I get, I get another badge. So I'm unlocking all of these badges and like, this is so goofy and it's, it's completely meaningless, but it keeps me engaged with the Grammarly product. Cause I think it's fun. And it's like, I like to see, Oh, where am I at? You know, what am I doing? Well, how have I done this week? Um, super silly, but again, just sort of a, a fun way, I think, to keep me engaged with their product and to remind me just how valuable Grammarly is to me on a consistent basis. Well, I mean, the thing is you call it super silly. And of course the way they present it, they make it fun and, and so <laughs> But come on, they're feeding that self-improvement, self-measurement, <laughs> yeah. how I make myself better kind of mentality. Uh, you know, like a, a, an uber geeky, uh, uh, highly driven person will just like dive into head first, right? Right, right, right. Uh, but they're using data, but they're making it fun and accessible because they know that they're, that some of the people who use their, um, who use their platform, right? Who use their software are are writing geeks like me, and so you know, I love to see that the words that I'm using are, you know, 
uh, are just more unusual than say, I don't know, 90% of people who use, use Grammarly. It's sort of like, you know, yeah, it's silly, but you know, it's a fun way to keep me engaged. Absolutely. So you're going to be joining us uh, in, uh, well, let's see, a few weeks time on May 2nd at our next 10X conference. Um, <laughs> Uh, at the uh, Colonnade Hotel in Boston. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you plan to be talking about? Oh yeah, so um, if you are not going to be with us um, in, is it, it's, when is it, May just yeah. came up? May 2nd. May 2nd, sorry, um, yeah. Fantastic event, uh, one of my highlights of last year. I was there last year. I'm very excited to be back this year. Um, I'm gonna be talking about just, you know, sort of what's what's new, like some of the opportunities that I see from a content marketing standpoint in marketing, um, but also some things that I think we can safely avoid, at, at least for right now. So doing more of what matters and kind of ignoring the rest. Um, fantastic event, so please join us. And and this is completely unsolicited. These guys did not tell me to say any of this, but truly it's a, it's a very special event and it's just, it's a fantastic experience. Everyone at, um, at Next10 just really knows how to, just how to make the experience really great for the people who are attending. So please join us. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Anne. Yeah. And for, for, Anne yeah. and for, for my part, I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, what I see the biggest uh, opportunities are in digital marketing. Uh, there'll be a little bit of an SEO bent to that, but also some content marketing things and and uh, leading into some conversations about uh, voice. So mm. uh, we uh, have great speakers. Uh, we could pull back the next 10x slide, please. Uh, so uh, Chris Brogan will join us, uh, uh, Dwayne Forrester, uh, Ben Morris of Google, Martin Split from Google, Ben and Martin are fantastic speakers. Um, so if you're interested, you could see the short URL there for the conference. Uh, Bookends is get, gonna get you a discount code, saves you $100 off and hope that you all can join us. But now let's spend a few minutes and uh, take some questions. Um, uh, so if you have any questions for Ann or, or I, um, you know, please feel free to put those in the chat. We're uh, uh, very much looking forward to seeing what those of you out there uh, want us to pontificate on. <laughs> is there, um, while we're waiting for questions, can I, unless, is there a question already or do you want to, uh, uh, I was going to no. show you another one of my favorite examples. Okay, sure. Let's do that while we're waiting. All right. For can we bring All up right. my, the BarkBox example? All right. So we'll have that up. We'll bring that up a in a second. So yeah. as I'm talking to you here today, I have a, a 15 year old, she's almost 15 years old, Cavalier King Carol Spaniel, wow. a little dog underneath my desk. Um, wow. She's, you know, uh, she's a fantastic dog. She's, she's my heart. She's such a, she's such a great girl, but BarkBox will forever be cemented in my brain as my one of my favorite brands because they do such a great job personalizing their email, right? So they know that my girl is an old girl. <laughs> and, um, and so they send me offers on a regular basis to add to her quality of life, you know, to make sure that she's living the best life she possibly can live and that we can make it as long as we possibly can. So yes, like they're they're they know that Abby is almost 15. So they're so they're detailing that. But you know, we were talking about tone of voice and how important that can be just from a brand perspective to personal Personalize the experience for your customers. And BarkBox does such a great job because the email, which I know is too tiny for, for folks here to read, but it's hilarious. It's so well written. Now, it's not hilarious for everybody, but for dog people like me, especially, you know, older, older dog people <laughs> or people with older dogs. Yeah, that's what yeah. I meant to say. Um, you know, it's just, it's such, it, it delivered such a great experience to me, like that, the, that top photo right there of Carl, who's 72 years old. The copywriting on there, the tone of voice that they're using, it just completely grabbed me. And um, and yes, I absolutely did fetch some hip and joint treats for her because, you know, it really just spoke to me as the owner of an older dog. Um, not only because they they were targeting me through their promotion, but that that but the way that they wrote this email, the voice that they used, not just in this email, but across everything, it just it's they do such a nice job with it. So that's my second favorite example of personalization. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And basically, the, uh, again, back to that tone of voice and how yeah. 
how well they did with, with all of that. Yeah. So um, if folks aren't familiar with the Hangouts, there's a chat window that you can open, and that's where we're hoping that you'll put in some questions. Uh, but while we're waiting for something to um, uh, come in, I'm going to actually just expand a little bit on the voice conversation because um, I mentioned the, the joint uh, presentation I did with Dwayne Forrester a while back. And leading into that, uh, what we did is we did some research into um, the, eff effectively what research has been done around voice and how humans respond to voice. And this was actually spawned by the advent of interactive voice response systems uh, way back in the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, and they found things like uh, we're really wired as human beings to respond to voice. So, for example, a baby uh, in the mother's womb actually can recognize uh, um, their mother's voice. And we know that because their heart rate goes up when their mother talks and the heart rate goes down whenever anyone else talks, hmm. uh, which is a really interesting thing. And then there's other data points that, that show that... Um, People who are introverted respond more to introverted voices. Men respond more to men. Women respond more to women. Uh, so these associations uh, have been proven through extensive research. Uh, uh, for people who want to dig into that more, there's a very famous re researcher, a guy called Clifford Nass, that, that led a lot of this work. Hmm. But I just offer it because it just shows how the breadth by which uh, personalization uh, really impacts us. But it looks like we do have a... Uh, a question here. Uh, so Katie Go has a question. Uh, Eric, you mentioned uh, that personalization can boost SEO. How can you leverage SEO within your personalization strategy if Google can't always read dynamic content? So uh, on uh, pages, emails, custom dashboards. So um, I I'm actually going to relate that back to what you said in the very beginning and um, the response to the first question, which is, it's not really about the level of personalization you saw in the BarkBox example or in the Grammarly example that Anne shared, but more in the way that you appropriately identify your audience and broadcast your personality to that audience and create a good match between that persona you're broadcasting and your target prospects. Um, and if you do that effectively, that's what will draw a good SEO response. Um, the the more individualized personalization is at a whole nother level. So mm. not something that Google necessarily responds to. Um, sorry, I have to put on my glasses to read the question. <laughs> um, so this one is from Atik Amadis. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, so the question, uh, Anne, is, uh, is scale all that important for small businesses? They have to personalize in any case, don't they? And you just sorry, you just cut out for me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. The question is: Is scale all that important for small businesses? Don't they need to personalize anyway, just even to you know basically survive? Oh well, to the second part of that. Um... Yes, they well, yes. And I also think that for small businesses, the idea of personalization, especially in how they're communicating, is a whole lot easier. Um, I mean, I talk to big brands all the time who really struggle with things like um, like communicating in a human way and having a real human voice through all of their social channels and uh, all across every every way that they're that they're uh, reaching out to customers and so I think that challenge is so much easier for for smaller brands um, you know I mean the, the I don't think you necessarily have to scale but I uh, but I absolutely do think that you need to be you need to personalize the experience that you're delivering to customers and you know again I think it's a lot easier for for smaller brands at least that's my take on it yes although it's hard for them to find the time necessarily but that's where yeah as I said earlier you know if you're a smaller business you're competing with other small businesses you're not talking about having to put out content every single day, probably. You know, you mm -hmm. can take things at a more entry level, you know. So uh, one more question here, and then I think we're going to be out of time. 
Oh, so what are some of the metrics that Google uses to measure customer experience on a website? Oh boy, that's, uh, um, so Google doesn't, actually, let me attack it this way. Google has a lot of patents published about potentially measuring and evaluating customer experience and user experience. But there is nothing currently confirmed about what they're doing. Uh, so it's actually a very difficult question to answer. But I think the way I would answer is this, is we know that Google cares a great deal about this. Uh, so even if the only thing you cared about in the world was SEO, and it shouldn't be the only thing you care about <laughs> in the world, but if it were, you should therefore still for yourself care about customer experience and user experience. It's an incredibly important uh, part, even if it just plays itself out in how you get links or how people refer to your content or how people share your content, that's reason enough. Oh, and by the way, it drives conversion at the same time too. So there's just so many reasons to, to, to do this. Um, uh, but with that, I think we're out of time. We do have a couple of questions left. Uh, and would you be okay if uh, we shared those remaining questions and you and I could just uh, gin up some answers and share it with the audience after the fact? Um, yeah, I well, yes. I mean, right now or? or no, no, no. I'll send you an email. And then we'll... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, totally fine with that. Yeah, I'm, I, I have somebody basically knocking on my office door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I didn't mean right now, but it's a follow-up. Okay, no, we can totally do this. Yeah, no, I'd be, lo I'd love to do that, and and um, even better, come to um, the next 10x conference, and uh, and we can chat there. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Anne. It's yeah, been, thank you. It's been a joy as always, uh, and thank you all for listening. Uh, hope you got uh, good value out of it, and uh, hope to see you at the conference or somewhere else out there soon. All right. All right. Thank Bye. you. All right. Bye. Bye.